Hi, I'm George Norrie, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Knapp, and I've had time now to catch my breath. Sorry about that, folks. Um, guess I'm not as in, in as good a shape as I thought. Uh, secret study has been underway for almost five years, analyzing hair samples, DNA samples, that were collected at sites where witnesses say they saw Bigfoot. Uh, there are legal limits in what anyone involved with the study can say right now, but uh, because of a leak that came out a couple of days ago, Dr. Melba Ketchum, the primary scientist, had to release some information of her own. And the first line of that release, you can read it on, on our Coast to Coast website, it says a team of scientists can verify that their five-year-long DNA study currently under peer review confirms the existence of a novel hybrid species commonly called Bigfoot or Sasquatch living in North America. Now, that's one heck of a headline. You probably haven't read about it in your hometown newspaper, though, uh, because as yet it has not been published in any, any scientific journal, but that effort is underway. One person uh, well known to listeners of this program uh, is uh, Dave Politis, a former police officer who became a Bigfoot researcher and who has been instrumental in collecting the hair samples. Dave, uh, great to have you on the program. Hey, thanks a lot, George. Thanks for doing this at the last minute. Uh, I, I know you're under you're under legal limits. What you can say, right? Correct. How much can you say? Well, I I could kind of uh, color in between the paragraphs and offer a, a little more perspective to the listeners about what was released. Okay. Namely, that um, in the past, and we can go back say ten, fifteen years before we started this study. Uh, there were a series of DNA tests that were completed by other people on suspected Bigfoot Sasquatch hair. And the reality of those is they all came back as human. And those were mitochondrial tests. And each time that those tests came back as human, the researchers and the lab personnel would say that the tests were compromised by contamination. And... We think the reason for that was is that if you look at the Bigfoot world, every researcher going back in time for the first 30 or 40 years believed Bigfoot was an ape or a gorilla along the lines of something called Gigantopithecus. And for some reason, all of these researchers refused to listen to Native American and First Nations people who all state it's a human, that it has a language, they trade with them sometimes. They're people. They're a type of people. They're different, and they have certain abilities that most people don't have, but they're different, but they're people. Well, everyone seemed to ignore that, and everyone seemed to ignore the, the DNA results that came through. And so we, we developed a mission statement as an organization that we were going to start, and we were going to complete this, and we are going to go through the end. And uh, one of the first things that came through was uh, I was in Hoopa, and there was a sighting of a Bigfoot at a house in Hoopa, kind of going through the garbage. The female there called the police. The police responded. And essentially, there was hair left that was pulled off the Bigfoot as it was reaching over a metal containment area where the garbage was at. And when that hair is pulled out of people, there are little sacks at the end of your hair that contain the DNA that really is useful with hair. And in Bigfoot hair, if you just have the hair itself without the follicle, the, hair, the DNA inside the hair shaft is so fragmented, it looks nothing like human uh, DNA inside of a shaft. It goes for a few segments, it'll stop. It goes for a few segments, it'll stop. But the hair itself has a unique look that to a hair and fiber analyst, somebody who testifies in court that they can identify hair from different species, animals, people, etc., it has a distinct, unique look only to itself. And if you put it next to 50, 60, 100 different types of hair, that hair and fiber analyst could pick that out as Bigfoot hair every time. 
So that was one of the screening mechanisms that we used at the very beginning to determine what we were going to study, how far it would go in the gene test, etc. Make a long story short, we ended up getting dozens and dozens of samples along with other types of samples. And Dr. Ketchum did something that no other scientist has done in this DNA testing process. And that is she was able to unlock a method to get to the, the DNA itself and to figure out how to test for it. And it, it was a very complicated process. Everyone else seemed to give up or think that it was just contaminated. In reality, all those other tests that people did, they probably were not contaminated, but the roadblocks and the time-consuming method to get to those issues were so great that everyone just quit. Ketchum continued, and she was probably uh, pushed along by myself and a few others who knew what we had, knew the samples were valid, they were good, they were unique, and the hair and fiber analysts had cleared them and said, no, these are, these are the real deal. And finally, as we get down to the end, and in the releases just the last couple of days, she stated that uh, these are very unique homo sapiens type samples, meaning they're modern human. They aren't, they aren't ancient human. They're within the last 15,000 years, meaning that the evolution of their genetic profile is within that last 15,000 years. But the real unique thing, and the thing that kind of has everybody aghast, is that through the DNA, you can know, because of something called GenBank, you can know where the male comes from and where the female comes from going back in your lineage. So say for me, I know that my dad came from Greece and my mom came from Russia. And you can find that in, in everyone's DNA. Well, in this, we can tell where the mother came from in, these, in all of these samples. But the, the origin of the male is nowhere in the billions of documented DNA ever seen. Now, there's a nasty rumor going around the world that in the paper it says this is angel DNA. Oh, jeez. And nowhere in the paper does it say that. I can guarantee that. There's been a lot of that stuff. I mean, I you know, I've had to bite my tongue, as you have, during this thing as it's been going on, but there have been internal link leaks and infighting and and spurious statements that have been leaked out seemingly to do damage to this study to to thwart it before it ever gets made public right correct i mean there's there's competing groups that have started within just the last year saying that they were going to come out with results quickly etc cetera, etc cetera. but really the value in this study is that all all of the testing came back identical meaning that if they tested you and me and your wife and all of our friends, we would all come back as homo sapiens. Well, all of these came back as a unique species in and of themselves, human, modern human, but very, very unique. My gosh. I mean, uh, let that th sink in a little bit, that somewhere 15,000 years ago, humans crossbred with something else from somewhere else, both unknown. That, that is, that's big stuff. I should also clarify that uh, they went through specific testing as well. They aren't Neanderthals and they aren't Denisovas. So, so that's out of the picture. These, these are thinking, breathing, intellectual people that are quite different. And they're not just talking about an undiscovered primate species, some uh, large ape roaming around the forest that's just, you know, as, as a lot of Bigfoot researchers have been looking for. No, and that's, that's probably where a lot of the dissension in that community comes from. Because if you look at uh, all of the researchers, the older ones that were the mainstay that wrote a lot of the books with ape in them and the North American ape, et cetera, et cetera, well, that, those are all going to be history lessons for us because it kind of invalidates all of those findings. Do you know a timetable? Uh, I know that there has been great difficulty in getting uh, scientific journals to publish the results. Do you, can you talk about that part of it? You know, I, 
honestly tried to keep my distance from that because I didn't want people to say, oh, you know, you're not telling me. I, I really didn't want to know. I want to know that we're making progress. I wanted to know that we were moving forward. I do know that the this most recent leak came from someone in Russia, and the person knew a lot about what was going on. So I don't know exactly how they knew, but I knew that we're very far along with uh, a journal. I, I, I believe it's imminent probably within the next 7 to 10, 10 days. But uh, I know that Dr. Ketchum said, well, you know, she'll clarify some of what was been leaked rather than just let it sit out there. And that's the reason she came out like this. I, I know that there was also uh, an announcement a couple of months ago, and it just was out of the blue, just really weird. Some prominent scientists in, in Britain said, hey, we're going to start looking at Bigfoot DNA. Struck me as they must have found out that you're on the cusp of something, and they wanted a piece of the action. It's a group of people that have beliefs that definitely don't fall in line with the results that we've had. I can only imagine what the reaction of the scientific community in general is going to be to this. I mean, the fact that in the release that uh, Dr. Ketchum put out, it mentions Bigfoot, it mentions Sasquatch. You're going to be have people who won't even look at the at the data. They'll just reject it out of hand because of those terms. You know, since I, since I got inside the Bigfoot world, several years ago, and I started to do this kind of work, and you try to do it with a real pragmatic approach, using professional standards, etc., and when you approach people in these academic institutions with this evidence, say it was hair or, or it was a bone or something, it's discounted almost immediately, and the people in some areas are actually afraid to touch it. It, it, well, it, was, it was amazing to me. Before we found... Dr. Ketchum, we had interviewed several other labs, and uh, Dr. Ketchum had probably the, the best answers to our questions when we approached her, and that's one of the reasons we went to her with this. But the reality of it is that some scientists in some areas are so closed-minded to this possibility that it's, it's hard for me to call them scientists with that type of attitude. So it was you and your group that took samples out to labs to try to find one that would work with you, as opposed to Dr. Ketchum being interested in Bigfoot. She wasn't a Bigfoot researcher at all. No, not at all. Well, that's that's encouraging in some ways. You, and uh, you were able to, to talk her into it. She got a team together. I can imagine that was pretty tough to, to keep it all together, to keep uh, serious leaks from happening as the evidence started mounting. Well, I think that the, uh, when we came onto your show, we, we needed a bigger swab of North America. We, we had certain samples from certain areas, but we wanted a, a pretty much a cross-section. And when we made the appeal on your show a couple years ago, we got the response that we were looking for, and I would say probably 95% of those appeared to be good samples. And once you start working with that many people that are just a cross-section of the world that are outside that world of science, there's bound to be leaks. They're going to tell their brothers, their sons, their daughters, and not by anything, a mean streak in them. It's just bound to come out sooner or later. But, I mean, they didn't know what the DNA evidence was showing you. Well, I think a lot of people had a hunch because people really in the know, George, that are deep within this arena, that actually go out and really go in the woods and really try to do research and gain the trust of people that to gain the trust of people that have had these type of encounters, they've known, as I've written about, away from this study, they've known all along that these people, that, that these are people. And I, I've written in my books that these things have qualities about them that are nothing even close to apes and gorillas, yet it's been ignored many times by some of the best supposed researchers out there. Does this change the, the other central question about where they live? I mean, we know we see them in forests. W witnesses have been seeing them for hundreds of years, different versions of them all over the world, out in the wilderness areas. Does this change the equation about whether or not it's just an undiscovered primate or now a hybrid primate, or does it suggest they're from somewhere else, some other reality? Or is that too big of a leap to take right now? I think if you, if you just go by the pure science with Dr. Ketchum has released, there, 
They have all the qualities that you and I have with this one little twist about an unknown male side. And that doesn't mean, I don't think you can just automatically jump to, that means they come from another dimension or they come from another world. I mean, it's gonna, it may be hard for science to admit that maybe we really don't have everything categorized that's been here for thousands of years. Well, we sure don't. Dave, uh, before we move on to something else I want to ask you about, help me characterize what this news means. I mean, I'm calling it big news, smashing news, earth-shattering news. I don't want to overstate it. I guess, I guess it's too late for that. But help characterize what it means for humanity, for our planet, for our understanding of reality. Well, I should first say that I've believed all along by research that we've done that the government knows and has known for many, many decades that they exist. And a lot of it comes back from their denial on FOI, Freedom of Information Act requests, their constant statements that they lose documents, uh, their statements that they don't remember things, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that a, there's a certain section of the world that absolutely knows. Uh, I mean, we can look at, let's look at Russia for a second, and they're one of the, the, probably the most advanced of all the countries besides us in saying that these things exist in their country. Few countries are willing to admit it, but Russia is one of those that actually had a big conference on this last year in their country where they brought in researchers from all over the world. So I think that certain people know, I think certain governments know, I think it may be a hard pill to swallow that it's going to get the publicity it's going to get. And I think that if you're a science-oriented person, it's hard to ignore the quality of science that Dr. Ketchum and his team has put together. In fact, if you're a science-bred person, you can't ignore it. A few programs that I've ever hosted generated the kind of audience response that my interviews with you about your books, Missing 411, Generated. I mean, I still get emails pretty much every day uh, in reaction to those broadcasts. Can you give us an update? What's been happening since you were on the show last? Are cases continuing to come in? So we spent three years on this and uh, in the, ended up in two books. And I, one of the times I was on your show, I said, you know, I think we've, we've had enough. We're going to move on from this because we had exhausted all of the avenues that we had to find these quality reports that seemed to match this strange criteria that we developed. Well, after being on your show, I had hundreds and hundreds of emails saying, no, 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 don't stop. Here's a lead. Here's a lead. And the truth is that there's probably far more going on in North America than we really understand. And I think that with the publicity that your show gave us, it's, it's overwhelming almost how much knowledge we have now on these things. Um, like we were talking about the, the Bigfoot community blistering certain elements about Bigfoot and their beliefs. I mean, we have been absolutely blistered saying by a certain element, and we don't know what element it is, that are saying that uh, we've just plopped these cases together and we're trying to sell a story and... Uh, you know, we're con men because we're doing this. We never stated what's causing this because we don't know. In my book, uh, Tribal Bigfoot, I laid out a profile of what occurred. So a woman comes out of her house. She sees a Bigfoot leaning over a, tri- uh, a tin container grabbing garbage. Police officers respond, and they hear this massive thing thumping its way into the woods. Uh, they go over there. Everyone sees where it was leaning over this trash receptacle. They see the hair. The hair is recovered, and the chain of custody is kept. It's given to a hair and fiber expert. It's later given to a DNA expert. And so you have to lay this path down about how you know where it came from. I would imagine it would be a benefit to say that you don't tell the researchers where it came from, that it's blind testing, that they don't have any idea that it came from a Bigfoot. That would probably be smart, wouldn't it? So is that what you did? I mean, with the actual DNA tests, or can you say that? Can you answer that? Well, again, 
That would have been Dr. Ketchum's side of the fence, how she dealt with okay. the other researchers. you got to remember that these things have lived for thousands of years in complete safety. Uh, people have, There's a group that's hunting them right now in the Texas, Oklahoma area, and they've been hunting them with a massive group for the last two years, and they've, they haven't gotten in, and they won't. These things are smart. These, these, these Bigfoot Sasquatch are very, very smart things. They're they're not going to be an easy target, even if you sent a group of people out there trying to hunt them. I'm really not that concerned about that. But yes, part of the edict also is to get protection mechanisms in place. And uh, because they are slightly different than human beings, homo sapiens, there's probably going to be some different language to protect them as well. Dave, I know results are coming in fast, that, that things are happening fast. The, re- the leak came out in Russia. Dr. Kel- Ketchum issued her own release. Uh, there are a lot of things going on behind the scenes, but I remember when the two of you appeared on the program, you said, we'd like to, to come back and, and announce the results. Can I hold you to it? Well, for me, for sure. I can't speak for Dr. Ketchum, but when the paper's released, I, I would hope that we could get you get your her on the show because she's a fascinating intellect with uh, a great command of this topic that nobody else has. Well, I agree with you. I mean, I not only interviewed her on this show, but as you know, we, we met in person here in Las Vegas and... Wow, there's and there's a lot more to come. I mean, I'm not giving away too much to say that there's a heck of a lot of, of information that you haven't covered. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial. Dave Politis, you know, looking back at your, your original book, The Hoopa Project, it, it's still... All these years later, I don't think there's anything quite like And you look at these drawings by Harvey Pratt. Uh, these look like human faces. These are individual faces that he's drawn, uh, forensic drawings based on witness descriptions. Uh, they look like uh, people, uh, just big, hairy people, but people. No, I, I think that's the general consensus. That, uh, it sort of matches what other tribes have stated all across the U.S. And uh, when you try to find a group of people that have been here hundreds and hundreds of years and occupy the land to see to find a group that says they're an animal, I never could find it. And you know, again, I have no dog in the fight. I'm willing to listen to anything, but that just isn't there. You look back at uh, the Patterson-Gimlin film, uh, and it's, you know, uh, people can argue about it all they want. As far as I'm concerned, it has not been debunked. But that that being in that film looks closer to a gorilla or ape, not exactly a match, but it's closer to it than some of the creatures, uh, the the beings that that, that you you have drawings of in this, and the beings that are described in the in in the uh, the new book as well. I mean, um, you know, they're very close to human like, just much larger. So one thing I did with the the Gimlin film. It, and one thing Harvey has the ability at is, let's say somebody goes into a bank, robs the bank, has a beard on, has a hat on, and they're caught on camera leaving. Well, Harvey has this inane ability to take the beard off the face so you can see what the face looks like, so you can identify the suspect. So apply that to the Patterson-Gimlin film. Harvey took the hair off the face of the Patterson-Gimlin biped. It's in tribal Bigfoot, and it's stunning. It looks like a Native American man. I guess the argument could be made, and probably has been made, there are different types. There are different tribes, which is why some of the descriptions are so different. I mean, you have, you know, in the history of the phenomena, you have reports of different colors, different sizes, in your uh, accounts and these clippings from over the last couple of centuries, there are male and clearly distinctions between male and female specimens that are seen, right? Well, I think people forget how different humans are. Uh, in my presentations at conferences, I sometimes will take a variety of photos of Amazon tribal members, of people from northern Ukraine. Uh, of people from China, and I put these pictures up there, and it's it's phenomenal how different humans look. If they are some type of human, as I think they are, then 
it it just follows with what with what we understand about our own people. Yeah, if you were a space alien, you came here and and went back home and described what humans look like, um, you know, you might have some trouble. Uh, they can't all look like that, you know, from because uh, we we vary so differently. In these clips, you have some of them that are pretty short. I, I don't remember where it is in the in the book, but there was a, an incident where somebody's campfire, their camp kept being messed with while they're out in the woods somewhere. So they they waited and uh, lurked in the bushes to wait to see what came and did it. And the, as I recall, the creatures that came, it was one or two. They were short. They were like five or five or six feet tall, not uh, 10 or 12 feet tall, but covered with hair. And they were just kind of playing with the fire. It's not unusual that hunters and campers and other things in the woods have seen these things doing unusual things. Other times they're, they're seen in a lake playing like kids in the water. Um, it's, again, the behavior that you read about reminds you sometimes of children, and especially when the sizes match proportionally a smaller Bigfoot, you think, well, it must be a young kid. The attitudes are different in different reports, too. Uh, generally not hostile, shy, want to get away from people when they encounter them but they can be pretty nasty when provoked. Uh, there's a phenomenon that's reported in several of these clips where they throw rocks, big rocks at, at humans to sort of chase them off. When I started writing the Missing 411 books, there's a lot of erroneous information that I have associated this topic on Bigfoot with Missing 411. I never have. I've never stated that I thought that Bigfoot was involved in these things. Why? Because I've never read a credible article implying that they did. And since the 411 books came out, all of a sudden, people have started saying, oh yeah, you know, this campsite, these campers were killed, this was happening. And I get these once a year or say, and every time I follow it up, I find that it's not a credible source, it never happened, yet the myths keep perpetuating on the internet, and they're not true. And some people believe, oh, you know, it's a cover-up. As someone who has spent an enormous amount of time in these rural areas with these rural sheriffs and deputies, those people do not give a damn about what the federal government thinks about their behavior. And trying to convince them to keep their mouth shut, that's never going to happen. They will tell the truth, and the feds aren't going to be able to keep them clamped up. So when you hear these stories, oh, these campers were killed by something really mysterious, if it was happening, I'd hear about it from these guys. And they say, half the time they say, it's, it never happened. It's a completely phony story. So, uh, Well, I, I get the emails. I, I can imagine what your emails are like, but I get them uh, just because people know that we know each other. Uh, why doesn't Dave Politis go ahead and admit it's Bigfoot that's kidnapping people? And I, I would have to say this, uh, Dave, there are some accounts in this book, these newspaper clippings, where there are references to these huge wild men carrying off women and children. You know, there are never any names attached to it, though. You know, no, no. And that's, uh, that's the tough part of it. How can, you, how can you leverage it as credible if supposedly they were getting carried off? Who saw it? And why aren't the names there? And if somebody's writing about it, then say it. Seems to be uh, there are instances where, in, in these accounts, where uh, humans who are not aggressive and don't take shots at these animals... Uh, not only do they describe them as, I think it's it's gay, they describe them as gay, and I don't think it's in the context of gay as we use the term these days, but gay humor is what they said, like uh, friendly. And the number of times I have heard a hunter say, there's no way I could shoot it, it looked too human. It defi- I, I have never heard of a hunter say, oh yeah, I had to kill this thing, I shot it in the head, or... It it looked like an animal. I have not heard that. And I've heard the human side of it from a fireman, a policeman, credible, credible sources that continually say the same thing. And it isn't just one time in history. It goes way back in history. Uh, So there's something to this that got got a skew where they said they started looking like apes and animals and as you know, George, there's a segment of the Bigfoot world that wants to go out and kill one. And yeah. I don't have any idea why they think they need to kill one. 
maybe it's some kind of overload on testosterone, but they they should wake up to the reality they're never going to kill one. It's not going to happen. There are some uh, reports of where these people claim to have killed one or they've captured a wild man and they've brought him back somewhere on a ship or they've got him in jail and uh, invariably uh, he gets away or the evidence disappears, however. Yeah, and uh, probably the one case, and you know about it, the Minnesota wild man. That has a lot of intrigue to it because I've seen pictures of it and I've seen descriptions of it. And it is unusual, and nobody quite knows what happens to it. But a lot of people just poo-poo it and say, oh, you know, that was a fake meant for the circus. But the more you dig into that one, there was something strange with that. Well, I find myself rooting for the wild man or whatever it is to get away in all these cases, so I'm glad it ends up that way. You know, you look at where these reports come from. They're from major, these are major newspapers, too. I mean, the Boston Globe and the San Francisco newspaper, the L.A. Times, uh, and they, and it's some great writing. Some of these descriptions is just terrific writing. It's, it's somebody wasn't just phoning it in uh, when they were working on this story. And the fact that they come from places like Indiana and Iowa and Kansas, uh, that's not where we associate Bigfoot sightings, modern sightings at all. I was trying to think of why would Ohio and Pennsylvania be so prominent in the numbers? And it's because... I mean, that was a center of American civilization in the 1700s or so, 1780s, where the bigger cities were. It wasn't exactly the frontier because there were people out here as well, but uh, that's where the bulk of the population probably lived at the time. Exactly. And it's it's an interesting phenomenon when you start to look at the sighting locations in conjunction to the giant sightings and skeletons, and then... If you go back in history and you think about exactly what you said, where did we first establish civilization and cities? And as we moved west, where were these locations? But then even the weirder thing to me is uh, Ohio has a lot of these sightings. Well, that's Bruce McAbee lives in Ohio. He's a friend. And I, I went to spent four or five days with him earlier this year. And the strange things that he's told me that have happened in Ohio in the air and on the ground. It's really strange. <laughs> Bruce McAbee uh, is welcome here anytime. He's a fascinating guy, uh, both in person and on the air and in his books. Uh, you know, it was kind of surprising to see the early reports from Hungary. I'd never heard of Hungarian Bigfoot or Sasquatch reports until reading this book of yours. Well, I'd, I'd never heard of them either. And uh, again, a surprising, surprising fact that they're writing about it from there. And then in the Pyrenees, they, there's an article from there about a sighting. And when you look at the descriptions that they're offering, it's almost identical to what they're seeing here in the U.S. at the same time period or thereabouts. And then when you think about present-day sightings, again, from almost every continent in the world, which is unusual. Um, you know, some of the Uh, descriptions, obviously, uh, you have to take them in a cultural context. Now, I don't remember when the Jungle Book was written, but Mowgli, the character Mowgli, um, you know, he's described, that description is used in a couple of the newspaper clippings from that era that that you've collected here. Correct. And uh, people always tell me, well, what about the Star Wars creature that looks like Bigfoot? I said, yeah, that's that's kind of strange. That it was inspired by, maybe? Yeah, I don't know. It's, It's... it's a similarity. Um, some of the descriptions, I, I, I would have to leap through it here to find one, but it seems like the witnesses are saying that the wild men have clothes or items of clothing or just a loinskin kind of a thing, which suggests to me maybe they were humans. Maybe re- they really were literally wild men out there. Well, unusually and occasionally, even nowadays, you hear about Bigfoot wearing clothing. And kind of goes unexplainable because why would they do that? But, you know, maybe it's some association. Maybe they're trying to break a barrier if they're seen. Maybe they think they'll be accepted more if they're seen. Maybe people won't be so scared. You know, we could all throw in our conjecture about why that may be happening, but it happens too often for people to be fabricating it. I I hear it occasionally, but not very often. Um. If you were to communicate with a tribe these days, a, tri- a modern tribe 
that would still perhaps be in contact other than the Hoopas. Are there any uh, other tribes that you would say people that have a relationship ongoing with uh, whatever these things are? I would say it's almost every one. I mean, there's, there's famous stories out of Arizona and New Mexico on the high plains out there where uh, they have these and there's many times an association between, and this is where Bigfoot people start, their heads start spinning, but fact, where there's this association between Bigfoot and UFOs. Even in the Hoopa book, I wrote that many of the tribal people said that they saw a UFO in close time and space to the point where they saw Bigfoot. And they regularly saw UFOs on many of the tribal grounds. And when you talk to these tribal members, the elders, they believe they came from the stars. And they're, they're not, once they have your trust, they will tell you, hey, you know, there's this association between us and them. And they're a different kind of tribe and different kind of people, but they came from the same place we did. And when you start to go back and you look at the history of these certain areas, there's a lot of tribal people that will tell you, we've had visitations for hundreds and hundreds of years going back in time. And almost all of them believe that they came from the stars. Well, there are an awful lot of associations between these creatures being sighted in in proximity to UFOs, and it makes everyone uncomfortable. The Bigfoot people, the diehards, don't like it. The UFO diehards uh, like it even less. They're, they, they're not comfortable with that at all. But you have to follow it where it leads. And, you know, I, I don't have a conviction on it either. I don't know what these things are. I don't know what UFOs are or where they're from. But um, there's enough cases uh, over the centuries, and a lot more of them now, thanks to this new book, that you can't ignore it. I, I thought the interest, there was a couple of stories, clippings where uh, there are reputable witnesses who say they saw these creatures uh, engaging with cows, milking cows. So uh, this is the part that really, really is unusual. Several years ago, one of my best friends, their parents own a dairy farm. And I started talking to him about this. And I said, you know, I, I keep reading that they may be milking cows. You know, what do you think about that? And he goes, you know, let me go talk to my parents. So they own a huge dairy farm. And he went out there and talked to him. And this old, this, I think he's 80 years old, this guy's dad. And he looked at him and he said, you know, every once in a while, my cow will come back from nowhere completely milked. He goes, I don't understand it. <laughs> and then he, the same man told him, he says, you know, every once in a while I'm on the far corner of my property and something tells me, don't turn around. Get back on the horse or get back on my ATV and leave. And he does. And then the man said, well, you know, every once in a while I found a bucket way out in the corner of the property. I don't know how it got there. What so about I, dogs? I, yeah. <laughs> I, I think when you get the trust of some of these dairy farmers way out in the middle, they're going to tell you the same thing because I've heard it many times. Um, you know, there are some funny stories. I, they're not in this book, but I've recalled, I think you and I have talked about it before, about Bigfoot, uh, what they eat. And they'll, you know, they're kind of particular. This image of a Bigfoot milking a cow uh, sticks in my head. But, I mean, they've been known to eat a lot of berries and different kinds of fruit. Um, do they eat meat, as far as you know? Well, according to the tribal people who have seen them take deer, et cetera, they're an omnivore. And many times when the natives are in the middle of the woods hunting themselves, they'll come across a deer that's stuck up in a tree. And like a 250-pound deer, a native guy couldn't have done it. And wow. they don't know how it got way up in the tree. And it's so... not in a tornado or a hurricane zone. So how did it get there? Now, George, before we go on to the next call, I had a question for you, and maybe you sure. can kind of touch on it for the people here. Your work on Skinwalker Ranch, the researchers there saw something very similar to a Bigfoot. Can you tell us about that? Uh, actually, multiple times. Uh, it's more the tribe that, that encounters them. They've seen them there as long as they've lived there. There was a very dramatic instance. I've got the transcripts of the interviews with the officers and we went to the spot where it happened, but they, the dogs, there were police officers uh, patrolling tribal grounds. They have a gift shop that's just off the highway there on the Ute Reservation. And 
uh, the dogs alerted uh, the officers to this huge thing that was uh, just outside the window. And as soon as the dogs made a noise and the, this thing looked at the officers and shone a light on it, it took off running. And it went all the way through the community. And you could hear it. it I mean, it was just taking these giant strides. It knocked over garbage cans. You had alarms going off. And the, the police officers chased it. Uh, I think they they found some tracks. It led to, uh, there's a reservoir there that's just on the other side of Skinwalker Ranch, and that's where they lost it. It just kind of sort of disappeared. Uh, they've uh, seen similar creatures on the ranch itself. Um, I shouldn't call it Bigfoot. It's more like humanoids. And there's one particular instance that we've described on the program before where these two scientists and two other people who were observers up on Skinwalker Ridge had seen what looked like a dirty snowball of light that uh, that was floating just off the off the ground in the middle homestead there on the ranch and it uh, through infrared you can see the the ball of light started stretching into what looked like a tunnel and through this tunnel this creature started crawling they could see it can, can you guys these guys were really excited seeing this thing it's coming from somewhere else in this tunnel of light wriggling through struggling to get through this skinny little opening it pulls itself out at the uh, at the entrance to this uh, this tunnel, stands up. It's eight feet tall, um, featureless, dark, humanoid shaped, like a head with no neck on a on a body. It just stands up and then starts moving up towards Skinwalker Ridge, where these guys are watching it. And they can tell you they got the hell out of there. They were pretty scared about the whole thing. But uh, there have been multiple sightings of that by uh, humans, by um, scientists, by dogs. Uh, uh, the the tribe has the uh, best uh, handle on it and uh, has seen it all over the Uinta Basin. So yeah, it's pretty common in that area. And and of course, it's in proximity to a lot of other really strange stuff. So you have to ask the question about what is the association between these creatures uh, that are described in many different ways and a lot of other very unusual phenomena. There's a story that John Green wrote about. Uh, a prospector that was taken in British Columbia, where he took an affidavit from this man. And he was sleeping in his sleeping bag, and one of these bipeds grabbed his bag and started walking with him for hours and ended up dumping him in a cave. And he was eventually escaped, but he said he saw this family of Bigfoot in the cave, and they kind of watched him, and he kind of watched them. Uh, it's a it's a really, really good story. Who And the individual at the time signed an affidavit, I, I followed Green's lead and said, this is a good way to document the stories I hear. And that's kind of how it came up, came to pass. I remember that story now. Yeah, that is a good one. Isn't there some other account in one of your books about a witness claiming to see a Bigfoot type creature carrying a person through the forest? So well, there's a story out of Wyoming that I, I don't put much credence in it because the people didn't come forward and they were doing something illegal. But a girl disappeared in Wyoming, and two uh, people who were poaching were out in the woods, and they claimed that they saw a Bigfoot carrying this body under its arm. So these people never came forward. I don't know who they are. Uh, the story was given to me by, from another Bigfoot researcher that's well, well known. And this guy was called supposedly by these two guys, and then he told me. So it's third hand down the line. I would say might be true, might not, but there's no evidence that it is. Um, the description from the tribes that you mentioned in your books suggests this thing has camouflage abilities, that it can cloak itself, that it changes shapes, and it can hide. Correct. That's, a, again, one of the reasons that makes this entire diff topic difficult to research. Yeah, I mean, we see it when it wants to be seen, I guess. Yeah. A great work. Uh, the title being 1680 to 1922, does that suggest that another uh, book of archived articles about these sightings could come some other time? Well, not really, no. I, and just so everyone knows, th this is a book that contains the actual articles. These aren't rewrites of the articles. This is the real deal. 1922 was a cutoff point for copyrights on those articles. Oh, so before then you could print them after them. You can't because they're still protected. Um, well, it's a terrific uh, piece of work. Uh, I loved reading it. I, I want to go back and read it again because there's so many details that uh, escaped me as I was preparing for the program. 
But as I said, some of the writing in this is just terrific, and it's always great to have you on the program. And I don't know when you sleep, but I hope you're taking care of yourself. <laughs> hey, I'm always I'm always eager to be on your show, George. And and the response I get from being on your show is out of this world good. So I appreciate the effort you put into it. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate it. And maybe we'll have you and uh, get Melba Ketchum back on here sometime and talk about that DNA stuff. That'd be great. All right. Dave Politis, again, the Bigfoot Wild Men and Giants is the new book. Check it out if you get a chance. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial. had uh, David Politis uh, on the program to talk about his book, Tribal Bigfoot, and uh, it's pretty impressive. It's impressive work. Uh, this is an elusive mystery. It's, uh, it's confounding. It's frustrating. I've uh, been around a long time, and nobody can seem to get to the bottom of it, but uh, David has approached this sort of like a cop would approach it, going out and interviewing the witnesses, following the evidence where it leads. Tell me this, David. Uh, uh, we're glad to have you back on the show, by the way. Well, I'm glad I got with you there, George. I appreciate the offer. <laughs> um, is this a solvable mystery? Absolutely. Uh, for many years, there's been a lot of people that have taken different venues and and ideas, trying to understand how they can come to some resolution with it. And from the get-go, we started off understanding that DNA would probably be the solution. And uh, we first tracked to the idea that we wanted to understand what we were dealing with. And the best way to do that, when I look back on my law enforcement career, was utilizing a law enforcement forensic artist to sit down with witnesses and draw exactly what the witness observed. And this hadn't been done before by other researchers. And uh, because of my expertise in dealing in that venue, I knew that a good forensic artist, when they sat down with a witness, would draw exactly what the witness saw. And we chose Harvey Pratt from Oklahoma. And uh, Harvey is the chief forensic artist for the state of Oklahoma. And as of a month ago, he is now the director for the Oklahoma Bureau of Investigation. He's a man of incredible integrity and an absolutely outstanding artist. And uh, every time Harvey sits down with somebody, when they're done, they are amazed that Harvey can get this out of them and uh, show exactly what they observed. And, uh, you know, what struck me the first time I saw his drawings is how human some of these faces look. And, you know, George, that, that is something that intrigued us the first night because there's so many stories out there about, this is an ape, this is a gorilla. But then once you start to talk to the Native Americans, and I don't mean just one tribal group, I mean across North America and, and Canada, of course, you start to listen to what they have to say, and they have never stated that this is an ape or a gorilla. They've always stated that this is another tribe of uh, Native Americans. They look a little different. They act a little different. They're a little more elusive, but they're another tribe of people. And once the drawings started to show consistency, and I'm not talking maybe five or ten drawings, I'm talking dozens and dozens of drawings, and sitting down with the witnesses and listening to their descriptive analysis of their own drawing, it's obvious that these things have some type of genetics that are similar, if not exactly parallel with ours. I want to, uh, you know, a lot of folks, of course, write this off. They say it's all a hoax. It started in 1958 uh, where somebody hoaxed some guys on a work crew in the forest up there in Northern California, uh, created these tracks, and it's, um, you know, sort of developed a life of its own ever since. There have been hoaxed films and hoaxed uh, footprints and things of that sort. I, I thought the most interesting, uh, uh, some of the most interesting parts of your book, Tribal Bigfoot, is the historical research that goes way, way back uh, long before there were any kind of media, mass media influence telling people to believe in Bigfoot. Absolutely. And people don't even have to, re to purchase the book to see some type of historical revelation. If you go to our website, and there's a segment there on the Tule River Indian Reservation in sort of south-central California near Fresno, and uh, they have an area right next to a river that uh, archaeologists have dated it back almost 1,500 years. And the pictures are on the website of what the drawings are that this tribe put on these rocks. And they look just like Bigfoot. And when you talk to the elders, they say, yep, our, our ancestors drew these because they were caretakers of the woods. 
They took care of us. They kept the grizzly bears away, and they took care of our tribe. And darn, if you don't look at those drawings and you say, well, 1,500 years ago, these people were drawing exactly what we're seeing today. And it, there's a consistency down along the lines. You know, even in the 1700s, there were, there were newspaper articles about big, hairy monsters or big, hairy people that were chasing others and stealing livestock. Isn't there a story about Teddy Roosevelt having an, an encounter? There absolutely is, yeah. And uh talks about a couple of guys that were uh, trappers that uh, were down in a river. He talks about another time where he was on a trip, uh, and he heard a shriek and a sound that he and the other people he were with, which were trappers and guides, had never heard before and didn't understand it and couldn't put it with any animal that was known in the woods. Going back to the historical records, um, you came across this uh, this resource, this book uh, from 1916 by a Yurok woman named Lucy Thompson. Tell us about that. Well, that, that fits so sweetly into what where I was working predominantly. I was up near the Hoopa Indian Reservation up in Northern California. I'd made good, good friends there, and it was just a good base of knowledge. It's about 30 miles south of Bluff Creek where uh, Patterson and Gimlin made their film. And... Uh, Doing some research, we found out that this woman, Lucy, very well-educated Yurok woman, lived on the Klamath River, and uh, she wrote about her experiences, and they were across the board, uh, how it was living there, how it was trying to get by, some of the perils of living along the river. And then she talked about these things called the Indian devils. And the Indian devils are described as <laughs> coming into their village at night, sometimes stealing food sometimes waiting until the male warriors left for the day to go kill deer, etc. And when they were gone during the day, the Indian devils sometimes would come down and take a, take a woman, take a young girl, take a child. And they would take them for different reasons. And sometimes they, the warriors would go out and get them back. But uh, there was a consistency in the story when we started to step across the U.S. and talk about other tribes. Same thing was happening in, in Washington. Same thing was happening in Oklahoma. There, there is that consistency to the story that cannot be ignored. Well, when you say that they called them devils, that makes me uh, wonder about the nature of the relationship between Native American tribes and, and whatever these things are. Because, you know, you read some accounts and they refer to them as the, our brothers in the forest kind of a thing, and uh, uh, they, they, they come and watch over us and help us, and then something like that. That doesn't sound like brothers in the forest. And that's a good point. And uh, a very well-educated Indian elder once told me, said, Dave, it's sometimes hard to understand and reconcile that. But imagine this, that if you were a group of, say, 50 humans living in a village, and you had a problem child that you couldn't tame and you couldn't take care of, and you excommunicated them from your group and you said, get out of here, you go live someplace else. Well, probably that happened because they couldn't live by your rules. And once they left, they, couldn't, they didn't have to live by anybody's rules anymore. So if you can imagine, and I know this is hard for some viewers to grasp, but if you buy the line that Bigfoot, Sasquatch has these human genetics in it, and every once in a while a, a semi-civilized group excommunicates one and tells them to leave, well, maybe it's that rogue one out there that can't be tamed and can't be civilized, out there and, and does bad things because, hey, we know in human genetics, we've got bad people, too, that do some horrendous things. Well, it, you know, uh, you, you mentioned in the accounts of this Yurok woman, Lucy Thompson, they claim that she alleges that the, uh, that the creature, whatever it's called, is a shapeshifter, that it can change its form, that it can become other animals. And I want you to address that specifically, but also in this context is, do you take th this account uh, literally, that she is describing things that really happened or as more like a folklore? I think most of it probably really happened. And um, when Harvey and I went back to Oklahoma, and Harvey is, has Native American himself, he broke down some ground for us so we could talk to some elders face-to-face -face and, and get what we believe to be the truth about it. There, there were these shapeshifters, according to the to the elders back a hundred years ago, and as times move has moved forward, they're harder and harder to find. Although they supposedly do exist, and I think that that could have been a way at times for them to reconcile this in their mind: how odd the behavior is, how unusual it is. And trust me, 
they do have some unusual behavior and they have some abilities that we don't have. But if you, if you can reconcile that by calling them a shapeshifter, but when you talk to the elders, that's a very, very rare, even in their community, 100, 200 years ago, to find somebody that could do that. It wasn't common. Well, shape-shifting, uh, it, does that account for all the different kinds of descriptions? I mean, you have so many different kinds in, in the book, uh, Tribal Bigfoot, different uh, colors, different shapes of the head, different look of the face. Um, are there just a whole bunch of different species? Is that your guess, or uh, sort of offshoots, or are, do they look different to different people? Well, let's think about the human race for a second and say, sure. if I put you in the middle of Beijing, China, and I said, grab the three closest people to you in Beijing, and then we go to the middle of the Senegal desert, and I say, grab three of the closest people to you, and then we go to an NBA basketball game, and I say, step onto the middle of the NBA floor and grab three of the closest players to you. How different are those people going to look when you stand them next to each other? And if you, if you understand how different human genetics is and, and how many different races we have in and amongst ourselves, When you start to look at the Bigfoot phenomena, whether it's called Almasti in Russia or Yeti in Nepal, these these bipeds exist on every continent and in many, many, many countries. And it's just not a 20th century issue. It goes back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So if you have that genetic evolution and, and that change, and if every once in a while they grab a human against their will, as Lucy described, eventually those genetics are going to get involved and everybody's going to look a little different. If all of these Bigfoot looked exactly alike, that would be suspect. But having them have that differentiation that you would find in human genetics, in people, in communities, it makes more sense to us. I don't want to beat this uh, too much into the ground, but I'd, I'd like to go back to these historical cases and ask you to address the significance of historical cases. When you go back hundreds of years, pre-mass media, pre-hysteria uh, kinds of things, when, when it uh, is obvious that the people who are seeing these things are not trying to sell their story to the National Enquirer, uh, what are they describing, and, and what is the significance in that in terms of evidence for you? Well, there's a, there's a very famous case where David Thompson was an explorer, and he was up near Jasper, Alberta, Canada, and the 1700s, and he got onto some tracks, and he was with guides at the time, and they found these giant human-type tracks with a huge stride in the absolute middle of nowhere. And Thompson wrote about them several times and talked about them later in his life, how he couldn't reconcile what it was. And other people said, oh, it's just a giant grizzly or something. And he came back and he said several times, no, it couldn't have been a grizzly, and it bothered him at that level. Then if you go back to Thule River and you say, well, 1,500 years ago they had these things uh, drawn on walls, and they, they look identical to what a silhouette of a Bigfoot Sasquatch is today. And if you can think, well, a lot of people put all the relevance into what Jerry Crew named Bigfoot in 1958 up at Bluff Creek, and really it's just been everybody falsifying and hoaxing ever since. But if you go back in the record... Even to the starting of newspapers, there are these stories, trappers in trapper journals. Uh, when uh, the people came over on the boats <clears throat> to the California coast, there, there are talks about them hitting land and running up against hairy giant people. Same thing on the East Coast. And one of the things we did early on was not only did we do our research on the researchers in this field, but we also did that historical search to try to understand how much validity we can put into it before we move forward. And it was overwhelming how much there is. And I put it in tribal because I want people to understand that there is background to this that's valid, and there's, there's this historical record that if you just kind of match the lines on a map, just like you match the lines on a, on a pin drawing of crimes, you can see that it starts to make sense. It didn't all happen on the West Coast. It's been going on throughout the United States and Canada for years. There's not one climate or one elevation where they proliferate and they don't exist. They exist sometimes in the desert areas of Southern California. 
Well, just like uh, other kinds of controversial, paranormal mysteries, uh, UFOs, you have a lot of folks who get involved in it and want to mess with other people's minds, hoaxers who maybe want to make a buck or they just want to attention. I remember these guys, what was it, two years ago or three years ago maybe, who uh, claimed that they had Bigfoot in their freezer and it was obviously described as a hoax. And then you have uh, cases like the the Patterson film, the, the most famous Bigfoot film, that really has passed a lot of tests and that a lot of people believe to be legitimate, but it also gets thrown into the mix and, and gets muddied up. Uh, wasn't there somebody who came forward at the deathbed confession that we made it up? I, I've heard so many different stories from different people, but what I tell anybody is I say, if you give me four hours of your time, I'll make you a believer that that Patterson film is absolutely a photo of a living hairy biped. Those guys did a phenomenal job. They were unbelievably lucky. And as, I, as I've spoke about at conferences, it was like the perfect storm for Bigfoot. These guys not only got a Bigfoot, they got a Bigfoot in the middle of an open area. They got him open for 30, 40, 50 seconds. Um, they found one that was extremely hairy and didn't run. It stood there and walked across an open area. It was Next, at the beginning when the film started, it was semi near a, a wooded area and could have turned and disappeared into it. For some reason, it didn't. It stayed out in the gravel bed and walked the entire distance and gave them an opportunity to film it. And what I tell people is I say, what, what are the odds of today a person walking through the woods that has some kind of video device compared to 1967? It's got to be enormous. We all have something in our, on us these days that has a video device. But you know what? That film hasn't been duplicated. No one has gotten good footage of a Bigfoot since 1967. So what are you saying, that that thing wanted to be filmed? I have no or... idea. I, I'm just saying that there's, there's peculiarities about it that, that strike as highly unusual, and these guys were very, very lucky. Great weather, an open area. It stayed out in the open. They were able to film it. My gosh, how lucky is that? It does. What about the deathbed confession? Am I remembering that correctly? Uh, never, never had one from uh, Patterson. From Patterson, no. I thought there was somebody else in in that story who came forward to saying that uh, he was close to them and they had uh, they had made it up or something. Now, there's there's been a few people that have written books trying to trying to take away the credibility, but honestly. Once you look at that film frame by frame and you see the muscles move and it, it flex as it puts its foot down and there's a couple injuries on it that it's just, it would have been impossible to make that in 1967 with the degree of uh, definition that there was. Even today, I think it would be very, very difficult. I'd like to get your take on the whole idea of uh, of hoaxes and uh, who would be threatened by this becoming uh, scientifically proven. You know, you got the UFO field that I deal with quite a bit, and and there are there are those for whom their worldview would be greatly upset. There are national security implications why people would want to muddy those waters, even cover it up, and a lot of evidence to suggest that that has happened. I just wonder who is threatened by a Bigfoot being proven beyond any doubt. Well, we've, we've talked about that a lot because in the last six months, we've filed probably 20 or 25 different Freedom of Information Act requests. Thanks for being with us, everyone, tonight. We're talking with uh, David Polites, who's one of the world's foremost experts on Bigfoot research. He's also the author of uh, two two books, one, uh, the latest one being Tribal Bigfoot. Excellent book. It sort of is a state-of-the-evidence uh, argument regarding Bigfoot. It looks at uh, what kinds of evidence exist uh, from the prints and uh, eyewitnesses and police sketches and descriptions, a little bit of film footage. What is it going to take to prove this beyond all doubt. How about DNA evidence? Before the break, David, I was asking you who might be threatened by uh, Bigfoot's reality being confirmed. Um, you know, why would somebody go out of their way to muddy the waters or belittle the whole thing or ridicule people like you? That's that's the million-dollar question, George. And uh, step back a little bit now. I'll give you a little a broader view of how we got to some of the answers to that question is if you look at the Patterson-Gimlin film, an, another oddity to it is is that they caught a female Bigfoot. 
And our guess is maybe one out of every 10 sightings by a, a witness is a female. So it's, it's a rare occurrence. So it's, that's another part of the enigma of that film. So we were in Yakima, Washington, and I was meeting with Patricia Patterson. And uh, Patricia has five plates that were made from the original Patterson-Gimlin film. And these plates are highly um, developed, meaning the, the picture that you can get off this plate is probably 10 or 15 times better than taking a photo of the frame of the film. And some people had gone up before us and had it scanned, and they did it at a very low resolution. We took the whole day, and at the absolute highest resolution, we got copies of these scans, and we, we gave them to some people to study. Well, while I was there, uh, two of us walked into the shop that rented uh, Roger Patterson, the camera that took the film. And uh, one of the guys is one of the owner's sons is still there, and I asked him if anything, if there's anything unusual that never really came out of this regarding the camera. And he says, well, the most unusual thing is, is he said he, when he was 14 years old, um, the FBI, two agents came inside of his store when he and his dad were working there and asked to see the camera that Roger Patterson rented. And his dad said he didn't have it. And the agent said, well, can you get it? And his dad said, well, I don't know if I can because I'm not exactly sure where it's at. And he said, but why can't I just give you a similar camera and that would probably do the trick for you? And the agent said, no, we want that camera. And he said, well, why do you want that camera? And he said that they wanted to measure the speed that that film was set at to understand how fast that biped was walking. And so that was almost two years ago now I was there. And we immediately came back and filed a Freedom of Information Act request on the FBI files associated with that request. And we write these very well because we have a couple friends that are agents that told us, if you write specific language, they're going to give you specific things. And if you don't, they're going to give you a lot of garbage. And we rewrote that thing four different times. And four different times the FBI said there's no such record of anybody visiting that shop, no such record of any investigation into Patterson, Gimlin, or the footage. And I, we, we have literally probably written 60, 70 different letters about this to them, and they claim that there's nothing and that they've never had an interest in it. Well, uh, what do you make of that? The alternative being that somebody posing as FBI agents was up there? Or no. do you think it was the FBI? No, because we've been in other locations and said, and people have told us that the FBI came in and asked them about things related to Bigfoot. And let's go back to that Patterson-Gimlin film for a minute. So there's, there's a certain frame there where the biped turns and looks right at the camera. And uh, one of the plates we have, very high resolution, it's a perfect picture of this thing turning around and looking. So Harvey Pratt is an expert of, say, taking a bank robbery photo where a guy puts on a beard and mustache and goes in and robs a bank. Well, Harvey can go in and take the beard and the mustache off the person and let everyone see what he looks like without the costume on. So we came back and we said, Harvey, can you do this with this picture? He said, yeah. And then he looked at it and he said, whoa, you guys are on to something. So he took the hair off, and it's, it's in Tribal Bigfoot, the, the drawing. And to me, what it looks like is it looks a lot like a Native American man. And to, the, to that point, if you go back to what the Native Americans in Washington and in British Columbia said in the 20s that this is another tribe. And if you listen to what Lucy said about them interbreeding, it all starts to fall together at, that these things have this genetic line. But they also have these uh, an enormous ability to uh, speed and strength that obvious humans don't have. Well, back to my original question on this point is uh, still what the why part of muddying the waters. If the FBI was up there asking for that camera, why? I mean, why is that a threat to anybody? And I think I think the obvious starts to come out the more you listen to governmental reps' stories about why these things aren't recorded in official docs. And we've talked to a lot of rangers who have had sightings, and they're told by their supervisors, don't write it down. And... I just interviewed a guy the other day, he worked for the National Park Service. Supervisor told him, don't write it down. And 
If you think about the government's control over everything, very rarely does the government ever want to say, we can't control the situation. If there ever is a situation that they can't control, it's Bigfoot in the woods of the world because they have no control. They may have some knowledge that they're not telling us about, but obviously their speed, their ability to conceal themselves, uh, the ability to use languages that we don't understand, but some Native Americans do. Um, If they said, hey, are we safe out there? How can the government say yes or no if they can't even claim that they exist? I know you're not crazy about getting into some of the more exotic parts of the uh, Bigfoot story, but there are, you know, kind of some anecdotal indications that these these creatures have ESP abilities or other kinds of exotic abilities. Do you take those stories seriously? I will tell you what <clears throat> the newspaper articles in the 20s said, and um, a group of three different tribes got together, and they actually held a press conference because they heard that some sheriff was going to go out and hunt these things. And they stated that, hey, they have the ability to mimic animals in the forest. So sounds you may hear really aren't the sounds you may be thinking, like owls and other birds and things, but they're Bigfoots communicating with each other. And they don't look a lot like us because they're real hairy and they're real big, but generally they're passive unless you try to hurt them or unless you get them mad. So don't go out there and try to hunt them. And then you hear these stories about people, and I've, I've heard... So many that they're sleeping in a tent, and they and they feel the rumble, and that's how it's described many times of these things walking up at their campsite because they're so heavy, eight nine hundred pounds, and they feel the earth move a little bit, and then they feel it right next to their tent, and it runs the gamut. What people they have a feeling of immense fright, so much so that sometimes they can't move. Um, sometimes there's horrific odor associated with it. Um, very rarely are they ever, is the tent ever touched or assaulted, but every once in a while it is. Um, people, but the general thing is that they can't move. And maybe, maybe there is something to that. I don't know. But until we we understand it or till we have some kind of chemical analysis of what's going on in the air or something along those lines, it's really hard to put, put our finger on what may be causing that. But I do know because I have been in law enforcement situations myself, I've been pretty scared many times, not to the point of where I can't move, but maybe your thinking is impaired at some level where you know, you're maybe not as reacting as fast as you would in a normal situation because you're trying to understand what may be occurring to you. Hard to say. Isn't there, uh, back to the Patterson film, isn't there a reaction by the horse or the animals, the pack animals in that film, to the to what's the, the creature out there in that field? Yeah, or you am know. I'm remembering that wrong. No, no, that, that's correct. Uh, whether the horse fell or whether Patterson fell off the horse, he did go down on the ground, and that's uh, that caused a big disruption. Um, if you talk to Native Americans, they will tell you that if you want a better chance of seeing a Bigfoot, you ride in on a horse because your odor, the human odor is up off the ground. And uh, I interviewed uh, a wife of an individual named Syl McCoy, and Syl was the head of the U.S. Forest Service station in Willow Creek in the 50s and 60s. And Syl was an amateur researcher himself, and he and Bob Titmus one day decided that they were going to uh, try to see a Bigfoot because there were certain tracks that were coming out of the Trinity River at this one location. And these guys were smart enough to get up in a Douglas fir tree 100, 150 feet up, up out of the air and sit there all night because they knew getting their, themselves up off the ground, they would have a better chance. And I, I will tell all researchers out there, that is the correct way to go. Because you talk to natives, you talk to the older researchers, you got to get that odor up off the ground, and a Bigfoot will walk right by. And the best, best example is you can read dozens of sighting reports from people in deer stands. Hunters right. in deer stands see them. Uh, before we leave this, the subject of the, the uh, cover-up or muddying the waters thing, you mentioned that you'd filed all these FOIA requests. Did you ever get anything out of any agency, uh, Park Service or FBI or anyone else that mentions Bigfoot, Sasquatch, anything like this? We got some, and, and in uh, one of the books I, I uh, included a uh, a report from the Army Corps of Engineers out of Washington, but 
that wasn't from a FOIA request. It was more of our own research where they talked about Bigfoot in an almanac that was produced by the Army Corps of Engineers in Washington. And they talked about it like it was a real being. So that, that was interesting. But we have, we have laid into it heavily in just the last six months, just like with a razor-fine edge asking specific questions on specific issues at specific locations. And this ranger that we interviewed the other day, I got that from a U.S. Forest Service a law enforcement officer who heard that this guy had actually seen one. We went and interviewed him. He goes, I'll go on camera with him. I'll explain what happened. But there were three of us in this one area. We all saw one at different times. We were told not to report it. Nobody wanted to hear about it. Why? Huh. And the paperwork, whatever was uh, – there, there is no there, there is no paper trail, at least in that case. They were just discouraged. Correct. What other kinds of evidence do we have, and what it would be the holy grail? Is it, uh, is it hair? You know, I, I honestly, I, I think that there's several different factors that could be considered the holy grail. Let's look at the footprints for a second. There's an individual named Jimmy Chilcott out of Texas that was a police technician. And uh, there's something called dermal ridges in a person's foot, kind of like the fingerprint of the foot. And in several casts going back decades, he found these dermal ridges in the casts of these large, giant prints. And literally, those those couldn't be faked or hoaxed. And he, he made several presentations that I've seen where he said, hey, these, these are real, real footprints from a real creature, but they, they're not made by a human print because the dermal ridges go at an angle that human ridges don't. So that's, that's one thing. Now, hair offers us some, some real obstacles, and I've, I've got the best lesson of probably anybody out there because I've been at this now for 27 months with Dr. Ketchum and her staff. In a human hair, 95% of human hair has a medulla in it. The medulla is a solid core that goes down the center of the hair, and in that is our DNA. And at the follicle level, there's nuclear DNA. And maybe 4 or 5% of the human hair doesn't have this medulla in it, and it's absent. Well, it's almost op- opposite for Bigfoot hair. Maybe 98 or 99% of Bigfoot hair, if it has a medulla, the DNA in it, uh, in it is so fragmented, is so minimal, that it's not workable. And until we've got multiple, multiple samples, and we try this over and over again, it just doesn't work. And so what I tell everybody, if you have a hair and it doesn't have a follicle at the end, it's worthless for getting DNA at a Sasquatch Bigfoot level. We need the follicle. And the follicle, obviously, is the core, the root that goes into the body. And unfortunately, for Bigfoot hairs, very small percentage of these hairs have follicles. Whether it's the way the hair comes out, whether it's, it falls out at some level very easily, we don't know. But we have, we've been lucky. We have some samples out of Oregon, some out of California, some out of Alaska, and some out of mid-America that are good samples. And that started it off working with Dr. Ketchum. And she has been one person that has shown an exorbitant amount of energy and interest because people that are hair and fiber experts have seen these hairs and they've ruled that they are like nothing else out there in the world. And there's no other animal, there's no other human that could have a hair like this. They look a lot like primate hairs, but... There's no primate out there that has this exact kind of hair. And uh, this, is, this has been stated before, and this isn't really anything new. But I suppose when she hears it from somebody that she deems credible, and he raises her interest level like he did way back when, when we started this, <clears throat> and now she starts to get into the DNA extraction from follicles of hairs, and it starts to raise her interest even more when she starts to have some strange returns come back. And I wrote about those in Tribal. And she will explain what those odd ups and downs mean and where we're going today. But we've been lucky. We, we've got some bone. I, I just submitted a bone to her the other day. Um, and some other people have brought in some other samples. So we, we have some tissue samples and some other things that are looking very, very promising. Now, early on when I was in Hoopa, elders 
told me, they took, took me out on the reservation, and they showed us where on the reservation these things lived in the most inhospitable areas you can imagine, way ups in rocks, crevices, places researchers won't go, don't want to go. And recently, we've had a series of sightings way up on granite ledges that where climbers were climbing and happened to see one. So all of a sudden, this is starting to make sense to us that obviously they want to conceal themselves, they want to stay away from us, and they want their privacy. So why not make it in a location where we will never go? That's number one. Number two is every Native American tribe we have interviewed says that they bury their, their own. A, a lot of pe- There's a lot of people out there that are very well educated that have been very reticent to be involved in this field for a variety of reasons. But to see somebody come forward and a group come forward with a methodical approach, a scientific approach, it, a lot of people are starting to come out of the woodwork now and are starting to participate where they didn't want to before. And there, there haven't been many scientific professionals that have stuck their nose into this for a variety of reasons. But now we're starting to see some involvement, and that, that is refreshing. That's amazing. I, I know the, the only other name that comes to mind for me is Dr. Jeff Meldrum, the guy from Idaho State, uh, who's been interviewed on a couple of programs, who's had courage in, in coming forward and saying he's interested in this research. In your book, in Tribal Bigfoot, you tell a story at the end about where he's up in the woods, I guess, with some TV show, Monster Quest or something, and they had some sort of an encounter out there? Yeah, Snellgrove Lake up in Canada. Uh, that, that, that's actually a great episode because you could see on their faces they were concerned. Uh, they were they were in the middle of nowhere. They flew into this lake on a float plane, and uh, they started to have some rocks thrown at them on a tin roof. And uh, the, the gentlemen there, including Dr. Meldrum, they they looked concerned. I, I think the way you describe it is they all got in the in the building and and hid out and locked the doors and got the yeah. heck out of there. I would tell your listeners that uh, for the people that are involved at some level that maybe have some strange type of visitors in the middle of the night and they have a hair sample laying around, send it in to us. Uh, it's under our contact information on our website. We'll gladly let you participate. We'll keep you updated. We'll put the specimen under your name, and we'll send it on to Dr. Ketchum. It's David Thank Paulides, uh, I, uh, always good to have you on the program. If you want to listen to our show ad-free, 24-7, access audio archives, live chat with me, and much more, you need to become a Coast Insider now. So you're telling me your grandmother, who died a few weeks ago, came and visited you last night in your bedroom, and you're not scared? Are extraterrestrials living among us? I don't know if it's true or not, folks, but we're going to find out. If you enjoy stories like these and want to learn more about the mysteries of the universe with me, become a Coast Insider now to access hundreds of our archived shows to listen anytime, anywhere. Sign up now at coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider. That's coasttocoastam.com slash coastinsider.